Part two of Chapter one of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blackstone, Book one. Chapter one of the Absolute Rights of Individuals, Part two. Roman numeral two. Next to personal security, the law of England regards, asserts, and preserves the personal liberty of individuals. This personal liberty consists in the power of locomotion, of changing situation, or removing one's person to whatsoever place one's own inclination may direct, without imprisonment or restraint, unless by due course of law, concerning which we may make the same observations as upon the preceding article, that it is a right strictly natural that the laws of England have never abridged it without sufficient cause, and that in this kingdom it cannot ever be abridged at the mere discretion of the magistrate, without the explicit permission of the laws. Here again the language of the Great Charter is that no free man shall be taken or imprisoned, but by the lawful judgment of his equals, or by the law of the land. And many subsequent old statutes expressly direct that no man shall be taken or imprisoned by suggestion or petition to the king or his council, unless it be by legal indictment or the process of the common law. By the petition of right, three Charles I, it is enacted that no free man shall be imprisoned or detained without cause shewn, to which he may make answer according to law. By sixteen Charles I, chapter ten, if any person be restrained of his liberty by order or decree of any illegal court, or by command of the king's majesty in person, or by warrant of the council board, or of any of the privy council, he shall, upon demand of his council, have a writ of habeas corpus, to bring his body before the court of king's bench or common pleas, who shall determine whether the cause of his commitment be just, and thereupon do as to justice shall appertain. And by thirty-first Charles the Second, chapter two, commonly called the habeas corpus act the methods of obtaining this writ are so plainly pointed out and enforced that so long as this statute remains unimpeached no subject of england can be long detained in prison except in those cases in which the law requires and justifies such detainer and lest this act should be evaded by demanding unreasonable bail or sureties for the prisoner's appearance it is declared by one William and Mary Statute two, Chapter two, that excessive bail ought not to be required. Of great importance to the public is the preservation of this personal liberty, for if once it were left in the power of any, the highest magistrate, to imprison arbitrarily whomever he or his officers thought proper, as in France it is daily practised by the Crown, there would soon be an end of all other rights and immunities. Some have thought that unjust attacks even upon life or property, at the arbitrary will of the magistrate, are less dangerous to the commonwealth than such as are made upon the personal liberty of the subject. To bereave a man of life, or by violence to confiscate his estate, without accusation or trial, would be so gross and notorious an act of despotism, as must at once convey the alarm of tyranny throughout the whole kingdom but confinement of the person by secretly hurrying him to goal where his sufferings are unknown or forgotten is a less public a less striking and therefore a more dangerous engine of arbitrary government and yet sometimes when the state is in real danger even this may be a necessary measure but the happiness of our constitution is that it is not left to the executive power to determine when the danger of the state is so great as to render this measure expedient for the Parliament only, or legislative power, whenever it sees proper, can authorize the Crown, by suspending the Habeas Corpus Act, for a short and limited time, to imprison suspected persons without giving any reason for so doing. As the Senate of Rome was wont to have recourse to a dictator, a magistrate of absolute authority, when they judged the Republic in any imminent danger. The decree of the Senate, which usually preceded the nomination of this magistrate, dent operam consules, nequit res publica detrimenti capiat, was called the senatus consultum ultime necessitatis. In like manner this experiment ought only to be tried in cases of extreme emergency, and in these the nation parts with its liberty for a while, in order to preserve it for ever. The confinement of the person, in any wise, is an imprisonment. 
so that the keeping a man against his will in a private house, putting him in stocks, arresting or forcibly detaining him in the street, is an imprisonment. And the law so much discourages unlawful confinement that if a man is under duress of imprisonment, which we before explained to mean a compulsion by an illegal restraint of liberty, until he seals a bond or the like, he may allege this duress and avoid the extorted bond. But if a man be lawfully imprisoned, and either to procure his discharge, or on any other fair account, seals a bond or a deed, this is not by duress of imprisonment, and he is not at liberty to avoid it. To make imprisonment lawful, it must either be by process from the courts of judicature, or by warrant from some legal officer, having authority to commit to prison, which warrant must be in writing, under the hand and seal of the magistrate, and express the causes of the commitment in order to be examined into, if necessary, upon a habeas corpus. If there be no cause expressed, the gaoler is not bound to detain the prisoner. For the law judges in this respect, said Sir Edward Coke, like Festus the Roman governor, that it is unreasonable to send the prisoner and not to signify with all the crimes alleged against him. A natural and regular consequence of this personal liberty is that every Englishman may claim a right to abide in his own country so long as he pleases, and not to be driven from it unless by the sentence of the law. The king, indeed, by his royal prerogative, may issue out his writ ne exiat regnum, and prohibit any of his subjects from going into foreign parts without license. This may be necessary for the public service and safeguard of the commonwealth. But no power on earth, except the authority of Parliament, can send any subject of England out of the land against his will, no, not even a criminal. For exile or transportation is a punishment unknown to the common law, and wherever it is now inflicted, it is either by the choice of the criminal himself, to escape a capital punishment, or else by the express direction of some modern act of Parliament. To this purpose the Great Charter declares that no free man shall be banished, unless by the judgment of his peers, or by the law of the land. And by the Habeas Corpus Act, 31 Charles II, Chapter 2, that second Magna Carta, and stable bulwark of our liberties, it is enacted that no subject of this realm, who is an inhabitant of England, Wales, or Berwick, shall be sent prisoner into Scotland, Ireland, Jersey, Guernsey, or places beyond the seas, where they cannot have the benefit and protection of the common law, but that all such imprisonments shall be illegal, that the person who shall dare to commit another contrary to this law shall be disabled from bearing any office, shall incur the penalty of a premunure, and be incapable of receiving the king's pardon, and the party suffering shall also have his private action against the person committing, and all his aiders, advisers and abettors, and shall recover travel costs, besides his damages, which no jury shall assess at less than five hundred pounds. The law is in this respect so benignly and liberally construed for the benefit of the subject, that, though within the realm the king may command the attendance and service of all his liegemen, yet he cannot send any man out of the realm, even upon the public service. He cannot even constitute a man Lord Deputy or Lieutenant of Ireland against his will, nor make him a foreign ambassador. For this might in reality be no more than an honourable exile. Roman numeral three. The third absolute right inherent in every Englishman is that of property, which consists in the free use, enjoyment, and disposal of all his acquisitions without any control or diminution, save only by the laws of the land. The original of private property is probably founded in nature, as will be more fully explained in the second book of the ensuing commentaries, but certainly the modifications under which we at present find it, the method of conserving it in the present owner, and of translating it from man to man, are entirely derived from society, and are some of those civil advantages in exchange for which every individual has resigned a part of his natural liberty. The laws of England are therefore, in point of honour and justice, extremely watchful in ascertaining and protecting this right. Upon this principle the Great Charter has declared that no freeman shall be deceased or divested of his freehold, or of his liberties, or free customs, but by the judgment of his peers, or by the law of the land and by a variety of ancient statutes it is enacted that no man's lands or goods shall be seized into the king's hands against the great charter and the law of the land, and that no man shall be disinherited, nor put out of his franchises or freehold, unless he be duly brought to answer, and be forejudged by cause of law, 
and if anything be done to the contrary, it shall be redressed, and holden for none. So great, moreover, is the regard of the law for private property, that it will not authorize the least violation of it, no, not even for the general good of the whole community. If a new road, for instance, were to be made through the grounds of a private person, it might perhaps be extensively beneficial to the public, but the law permits no man or set of men to do this without consent of the owner of the land. In vain may it be urged that the good of the individual ought to yield to that of the community, for it would be dangerous to allow any private man, or even any public tribunal, to be the judge of this common good, and to decide whether it be expedient or no. Besides, the public good is in nothing more essentially interested than in the protection of every individual's private rights, as modelled by the municipal law. In this and similar cases, the legislator alone can, and indeed frequently does, interpose, and compel the individual to acquiesce. But how does it interpose and compel? Not by absolutely stripping the subject of his property in an arbitrary manner, but by giving him a full identification and equivalent for the injury thereby sustained. The public is now considered as an individual, treating with an individual for an exchange. All that the legislator does is to oblige the owner to alienate his possessions for a reasonable price, and even this is an exertion of power which the legislator indulges with caution, and which nothing but the legislator can perform. Nor is this the only instance in which the law of the land has postponed even public necessity to the sacred and inviolable rights of private property for no subject of England can be constrained to pay any aids or taxes, even for the defence of the realm or the support of government, but such as are imposed by his own consent, or that of his representatives in Parliament. By the statute 25 Edward I, chapter 5 and 6, it is provided that the king shall not take any aids or tasks, but by the common assent of the realm and what that common assent is, is more fully explained by 34 Edward I, Statute 4, Chapter 1, which enacts that no talents or aid shall be taken without assent of the archbishops, bishops, earls, barons, knights, burgesses, and other freemen of the land. Footnote. See the historical introduction to the Great Charter, etc., sub anno 1297, wherein it is shewn that this statute, the taliagio non concedendo, supposed to have been made in thirty four edward i is in reality nothing more than a sort of translation into latin of the confirmatio cartarum twenty five edward i which was originally published in the norman language and footnote and again by fourteen edward the third statute two chapter one the prelates earls barons and commons citizens burgesses and merchants shall not be charged to make any aid if it be not by the common assent of the great men and commons in parliament and as this fundamental law had been shamefully evaded under many succeeding princes by compulsive loans and benevolences extorted without a real and voluntary consent it was made an article in the petition of right three charles i that no man shall be compelled to yield any gift loan or benevolence tax or such like charge without common consent by act of parliament and lastly by the statute one william and mary statute two chapter two it is declared that levying money for or to the use of the crown by pretence of prerogative without grant of parliament or for longer time or in other manner than the same is or shall be granted is illegal in the three preceding articles we have taken a short view of the principal absolute rights which appertain to every englishman but in vain would these rights be declared ascertained and protected by the dead letter of the laws if the constitution had provided no other method to secure their actual enjoyment it has therefore established certain other auxiliary subordinate rights of the subject which serve principally as barriers to protect and maintain inviolate the three great and primary rights of personal security personal liberty and private property these are one the constitution powers and privileges of parliament of which i shall treat at large in the ensuing chapter two the limitation of the king's prerogative by bounds so certain and notorious that it is impossible he should exceed them without the consent of the people of this also i shall treat in its proper place the former of these keeps the legislative power in due health and vigour so as to make it improbable that laws should be enacted destructive of general liberty the latter is a guard upon the executive power 
by restraining it from acting either beyond or in contradiction to the laws that are framed and established by the other. 3. A third subordinate right of every Englishman is that of applying to the courts of justice for redress of injuries. Since the law is in England the supreme arbiter of every man's life, liberty, and property, courts of justice must at all times be open to the subject, and the law be duly administered therein. The emphatical words of Magna Carta, spoken in the person of the king, who in judgment of the law, says Sir Edward Coke, is ever present, and repeating them in all his courts, are these. Nulli vendemus, nulli negabimus, aut differemus rectum vel justitiam. And therefore every subject, continues the same learned author, quote, for injury done to him in bonus, in terris, vel persona, by any other subject, be he ecclesiastical or temporal, without any exception, may take his remedy by the course of the law, and have justice and right for the injury done to him, freely without sale, fully without any denial, and speedily without delay. End quote. It were endless to enumerate all the affirmative acts of Parliament wherein justice is directed to be done according to the law of the land, and what that law is every subject knows, or may know if he pleases, for it depends not upon the arbitrary will of any judge, but is permanent, fixed, and unchangeable, unless by authority of Parliament. I shall, however, just mention a few negative statutes, whereby abuses, perversions, or delays of justice, especially by the prerogative, are restrained. It is ordained by Magna Carta that no free man shall be outlawed, that is, put out of the protection and benefit of the laws, but according to the law of the land. By 2 Edward III, chapter 8, and 11 Richard II, chapter 10, it is enacted that no commands or letters shall be sent under the great seal or the little seal, the signet or privy seal, in disturbance of the law, or to disturb or delay common right and though such commandments should come, the judges shall not cease to do right. And by 1 William and Mary, Statute 2, Chapter 2, it is declared that the pretended power of suspending or dispensing with laws, or the execution of laws, by regal authority, without consent of Parliament, is illegal. Not only the substantial part, or judicial decisions, of the law, but also the formal part, or method of proceeding, cannot be altered but by Parliament. For if once those outworks were demolished, there would be no inlet to all manner of innovation in the body of the law itself. The King, it is true, may erect new courts of justice, but then they must proceed according to the old established forms of the common law, for which reason it is declared in the statute 16 Charles I, chapter 10, upon the dissolution of the Court of Star Chamber, that neither his majesty nor his privy council have any jurisdiction power or authority by english bill petition articles libel which were the course of proceeding in the star chamber borrowed from the civil law or by any other arbitrary way whatsoever to examine or draw into question determine or dispose of the lands or goods of any subject of this kingdom but that the same ought to be tried and determined in the ordinary courts of justice and by course of law 4. If there should happen any uncommon injury or infringement of the rights before mentioned, which the ordinary course of law is too defective to reach, there still remains a fourth subordinate right appertaining to every individual, namely, the right of petitioning the King or either House of Parliament for the redress of grievances. In Russia we are told that the Tsar Peter established a law that no subject might petition the throne till he had first petitioned two different ministers of state. In case he obtained justice from neither, he might then present a third petition to the prince, but upon pain of death if found to be in the wrong. The consequence of which was that no one dared to offer such third petition, and grievances seldom falling under the notice of the sovereign, he had little opportunity to redress them. The restrictions, for some there are, which are laid upon petitioning in England, are of a nature extremely different, and while they promote the spirit of peace, they are no check upon that of liberty. Care only must be taken, lest, under the pretense of petitioning, the subject be guilty of any riot or tumult, as happened in the opening of the memorable Parliament in 1640, and, to prevent this, it is provided by the Statute 13 Charles II, Statute 1, Chapter 5, that no petition to the King, or either House of Parliament, 
for any alterations in church or state shall be signed by above twenty persons unless the matter thereof be approved by three justices of the peace or the major part of the grand jury in the country and in london by the lord mayor aldermen and common council nor shall any petition be presented by more than two persons at a time but under these regulations it is declared by the statute one william and mary statute two chapter two that the subject hath the right to petition and that all commitments and persecutions for such petitioning are illegal five the fifth and last auxiliary right of the subject that i shall at present mention is that of having arms for their defence suitable to their condition and degree and such as are allowed by law which is also declared by the same statute one william and mary statute two chapter two and is indeed a public allowance under due restrictions of the natural right of resistance and self-preservation when the sanctions of society and laws are found insufficient to restrain the violence of oppression in these several articles consist the rights or as they are frequently termed the liberties of englishmen liberties more generally talked of than thoroughly understood and yet highly necessary to be perfectly known and considered by every man of rank or property lest his ignorance of the points whereon it is founded should hurry him into faction or licentiousness on the one hand or a pusillanimous indifference and criminal submission on the other and we have seen that these rights consist primarily in the free enjoyment of personal security of personal liberty and of private property so long as these remain inviolate the subject is perfectly free for every species of compulsive tyranny and oppression must act in opposition to one or other of these rights having no other object upon which it can possibly be employed to preserve these from violation it is necessary that the constitution of parliaments be supported in its full vigour and limits certainly known be set to the royal prerogative and lastly to vindicate these rights when actually violated or attacked the subjects of england are entitled in the first place to the regular administration and free course of justice in the courts of law next to the right of petitioning the king and parliament for a redress of grievances and lastly to the right of having and using arms for self-preservation and defence and all these rights and liberties it is our birthright to enjoy entire unless where the laws of our country have laid them under necessary restraints restraints in themselves so gentle and moderate as will appear upon farther inquiry that no man of sense or property would wish to see them slackened for all of us have it in our choice to do everything that a good man would desire to do and are restrained from nothing but what would be pernicious either to ourselves or our fellow-citizens so that this review of our situation may fully justify the observation of a learned french author who indeed generally both thought and wrote in the spirit of genuine freedom and who hath not scrupled to profess even in the very bosom of his native country that the english is the only nation in the world where political or civil liberty is the direct end of its constitution recommending therefore to the student in our laws a farther and more accurate search into this extensive and important title i shall close my remarks upon it with the expiring wish of the famous father paul to his country esto perpetua end of part two of chapter one of the absolute rights of individuals